guys, and welcome to the Moms and Murder podcast, a true crime podcast featuring myself, Mandy, and my dear friend, Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Mandy. How are you? I am so good. How are you? I am so good, too. I'm equally as good as you are. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine. It's been a good week for me, I think. I mean, I can't tell you what your week has been like. So yeah, good for you. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to brag. I don't want to make you feel bad. So <laughs> <laughs> you did both of those in one simple word. So okay. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> no, it's good. All good. So before we get started this week, we actually have a very special shout out to give. Uh, Melissa, shout it out. <laughs> First of all, that sounded like a radio DJ from the 90s. <laughs> I was so excited. I got all nostalgic. A few weeks ago, we were contacted by a very nice guy named Mark who wanted us to say hello to his girlfriend, Katie Touches. And apparently she likes us. I mean, Hi. <laughs> do what you will, Katie. Um, but we wanted to say hi and thanks for listening. And we hope you have a very great holiday. And your boyfriend is great. He's so wonderful. Yes. I'm not trying to steal your boyfriend. I just want you to know he's very nice. But you knew that because he's your boyfriend. Good for you, Katie. Good for you. Yes. We got to move on because <laughs> this took an accidental turn. I did not mean for it to take. But Katie, happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Mandy, please go. Just go. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you so much for listening, Katie. Yes, uh, we you. really, really appreciate it. And Mark for yeah. also listening because he said he listens with her. So yeah. thank both of you. We love both of you. Okay, let's move on. I'm worried that they're going to like <laughs> delete us from their feed now and like file charges. So let's just go. <laughs> it could happen. It could happen. Okay, so um, and then one more quick thing before we get started. Um, I did want to say a quick thank you to Elma S. for helping with the research this week. This has been a case that she sent us a while back and has been kind of sitting in our pile of case research. And we are so happy to be doing it this week. This is actually... One of Melissa's favorite stories that contains yes. zero murder. Yay. Yeah. And since this is our last episode of 2018, we thought we would leave you kind of on a high note and not on a super low note. So, well, I mean, it's still well, a crazy <laughs> bonkers story. It's insane, but <laughs> yeah, no one dies. No one dies. Exactly. So today we're going to talk about a very wealthy couple named Reed and Quinn Gray from Ponte Vedra, Florida. And to give you an idea of where this bizarre story takes place, we're going to tell you a little bit about it in this week's segment of We Googled the City. Ponte Vedra is a seaside community located in St. John's County, Florida. It's in the northeast part of Florida. It's actually pretty close to Jacksonville and has a population of around 30,000 residents. Ponte Vedra is home to the PGA Tour, TPC Sawgrass, and the Player Championship. You're familiar with all those, Mandy, right? We're just like, we know those. Those yeah. just roll off the tip of my tongue. Of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's a really big golfing haven, I guess. There's several golf courses and tennis facilities, tons of restaurants, spas, boutiques of plenty. This is just a very posh little area, apparently, near Jacksonville. And so while Ponte Vedra is now home of golfers and tennis players, um, it used to be quite an industrial town. The now posh community was originally referred to as Mineral City in the early 1900s, as it had minerals such as titanium that was being recovered from the beaches. And having this resource was incredibly profitable to the town during World War I, as titanium was actually used in poison gases during the war, which I literally have no idea what anything is used for. So I'm always like, this is this is so cool. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's sad the amount of things I learn in a day. But legend has it that while working on these gases, uh, working with titanium, several of the men grew bored and began writing songs to sort of pass the time. And one of the more infamous lyrics is, push me down, I won't fall, I am titanium. <laughs> <So> <laughs> all I have. So please don't sue us, Sia. <laughs> That's it. Just roll music. Play me out. Play me out. <laughs> These just get better and better every week. <laughs> oh, gosh. I love it. I love it. 
So Reed Gray and Quinn Hanna were married in October of 2000, and Reed was a very successful businessman in the field of home health care who had climbed his way to the top and single-handedly made himself a lot of money. And Quinn was a nurse who turned into a stay-at-home mother after having two little girls. The family appeared to have it all, largely in part to the fact that they were filthy rich, with the couple having more than $5 million just sitting in the bank. In 2009, the family moved into a beautiful 4,500 square foot, $4 million beachfront home in Ponte Vedra. And the current value of that home is now $5 million. So it gained a million dollars just from, you know, 2009 to now. So it's a nice house. I guess that's what it tells you. It is. Yeah. Right. (laughs) That's exactly what it tells us. Yeah. (laughs) So Friday, September 4th, 2009 was actually not too long after they had moved into this home. And it started off as a typical day for Quinn Gray. She dropped her daughters off at school. They were six and eight years old at the time. And then she went to the spa, had a facial, went to a yoga class, and then returned home to change clothes and prepare to pick her children up from school that afternoon. As Quinn searched her closet for something to wear, believing that she was in an empty home, three men with a gun approached her. After a brief struggle, one of the men told Quinn that he wasn't there to hurt her, but that she was being taken as a hostage until her husband, Reed, coughed up $50,000 that he supposedly owed to a loan shark. Quinn was instructed by her captors to write her own ransom note to be left for her husband to find, and she quickly jotted down a somewhat lengthy note on a yellow pad of paper that outlined the demands of the men who had abducted her. It stated that professionals had kidnapped her and they wanted $50,000 in cash. They did not want any police involved and that her husband would be watched. So basically don't try any funny business. The ransom note also included a lot of details to help Reed, such as that he would not be able to withdraw more than $9,500 from the same place. So he would have to go to four different banks to complete this whole transaction. She also noted in this ransom note that they only had $7,000 in their bank account at the time. So that was all he would have access to immediately. Wait, so she knew all this information. Is she being helpful or are they being helpful? Like which one of them... It yes. sounds like they knew already that, like, hey, you can't get that much from your bank. Yeah. Well, right? maybe they maybe they asked her, how much okay. do you have access to? And she said, I have $7,000 in my bank account. And then I don't know if she knew or they knew that you wouldn't, you know, there's a limit to how much you can withdraw right. at a bank. But she included that information in the ransom note so her husband would... Have an it's easier- like saying, like, turn the oven on before you leave. Like, yeah. He's going to figure it out <laughs> at the first place. You don't really need to label them all, but okay. Yeah, yeah Continue. exactly. <laughs> so at around 5 p.m., Quinn made a frantic call to Reed while he was at work. She told him that she had been kidnapped by three Albanian men, and she begged her husband to cooperate with every demand that they made or she would be killed. So Reed immediately ran outside into the parking lot after getting this phone call from his wife and dialed 911 in a complete panic and told the operator that his wife had been kidnapped and the kidnappers had threatened to shoot her if he went to the police. And he was just obviously hysterical, pleading with them, you know, to help. So a SWAT team was dispatched to their sprawling oceanfront property and Reed was told to pick up his daughters and take them to a friend's home and then go to the sheriff's office and wait for more information. So here's one question I had. Obviously, the note says don't call police. I'm assuming in the phone call she's telling him not to call police, and he immediately called police. I'm not saying he's wrong because I totally get. I was going to say that's like a total Melissa thing to do. Oh yeah, I'm totally going to do it. (laughs) But it is kind of crazy that not crazy. I shouldn't say that, but it is kind of strange that you aren't like taking a minute maybe to like say like is 911 the best way to go about this? Do you know what I'm saying? Like. Yeah, it's very public and very like you're literally saying, what did you just say to me? Perfect. Hang up. Call 911. Like, yeah. <laughs> it was a very quick turnaround there. But I understand, too, because I mean, come on, I would call immediately and rat them out. So, yeah, 
Crime scene techs did a complete sweep of the home um, when they r- arrived there, looking for any clues as to who these kidnappers could be. They also, at this point, find the ransom note, but they don't really find any other real clues. Reed was obviously a wreck whenever he got to the sheriff's office, and he told detectives he hadn't borrowed any money from any sort of loan shark. And of course, like $50,000 is sort of a drop in the bucket to these people. And, you know, that same year, he had made over a million dollars. So, um, to go to a loan shark of all people, you yeah, know, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, but it, I remember watching part of that. We had to watch like a really crappy version of Dateline on YouTube. So like, there's like celebration noises going on and like yeah. emojis <laughs> flying through, and everybody's voices are like peaked up thirty octaves. Um, but he was saying like in the interrogation room, he's like, I'm in like a TV detective room and stuff. Like it was kind of weird to watch somebody going through you know like a normal person would go in there and be like oh this feels like a tv show yeah and he was even saying like this feels like a movie like none of this feels real it's crazy so reed tells the police that you know the couple has suffered some marital strife in the past but the last few months have actually been some of the best ones they've had and they were even considering at this point having a third child so detectives keep reed in the office before actually letting him go and rest it's obviously a lot of information to take in at one time but he wasn't even there very long before they sent him on his way really yeah I didn't well think. i mean yeah i mean he's the victim's husband and he's exhausted and he's obviously you know when well, they have kids yeah, and so what are you going to do? You can't keep him there all night, you know. So yeah. they let him go home so he can try and get some sleep and then I think the understanding was that he would go back in the morning and continue helping, right. you know. Well, and it's a missing out. person, it's not a murder. Like that's a lot to You know what I mean? They would keep you Right. Until they had answers, really. So after a sleepless night, Reed actually sends a text to Quinn's phone and he's like asking, you know, hey, are you okay? Can you just let me know you're okay? And he receives no response. So Reed meets up with investigators later that morning and surprisingly, Quinn calls him while he is sitting with police. And she tells him that they would be calling back soon to give directions on how to exchange a ransom. So Quinn sounds pretty agitated and upset. And obviously she's going through a lot in these uh, recordings. Um, And Sheriff Shore was surprised to actually hear Quinn's voice on the phone because even watching movies and stuff, you typically don't hear the victim's voice. It's normally the abductors talking to, you know, the police or talking to the spouse or whatever and saying, you know, we'll let you talk to this person, but this is what you have to do first. So for her to yeah. call was a little like, okay. Yeah. yeah, you don't expect somebody who's been kidnapped or abducted they're not usually given access to like a cell phone to, and especially not their own cell phone to say, here's your phone. You can right. call whoever you want and say whatever you Just want. Just watch so, your minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was a little bit strange for the detectives. So less than an hour after Quinn calls Reed, she calls again to let him know where he needs to go for this money drop. And then she hangs up telling her husband that her kidnappers were super angry and that he's actually gotten the police involved and that now he's going to, you know, he's going to have gotten her killed because of his, like, involving the police. She's dead because of him. So she's obviously super, super irritated. Not even irritated. I need to accelerate that or escalate that. She's, like, angry at him. Yeah. And <laughs> sounds incredibly scared and is like, this is what you've done to me. Like, she was blaming him, really, at that point. So investigators held Reed at the sheriff's department and sent police surveillance teams to the location along with the ransom money. And the goal, of course, is drop the money, you get Quinn back, everything's fine. She goes back to her family. So while the team is en route, Quinn calls again and gets mad at Reed for messing this whole thing up and says, you know, change the plans. They're telling me now we're going to drive to a Chick-fil-A and sit in the parking lot. Um, You're going to drive to Chick-fil-A, sit in the parking lot with your convertible top down. So this whole thing feels very Florida at this point. I was like, oh, where is Florida going to show up? This is where Florida shows up. And we just are going to (laughs) keep showing up at this point. (laughs) So before police even get to Chick-fil-A, Quinn calls again and says that the abductors have have spotted three fed cars in the area of this Chick-fil-A, and now she's being taken somewhere else, and she doesn't know where, and she sounds super, super annoyed on this call, and she then texts Reed and says, I know you want me dead. So she's, like, had enough, and she's like, what are you doing? You must want me killed because, yeah, Yeah. (laughs) like, because – 
you're okay. not doing any of this right. So obviously the next logical conclusion is that you want them to kill me. Right. So <laughs> <laughs> That's like a very big response to send to somebody. Yeah. Um. <laughs> oh, this would be 100% me if I had been abducted. I would be texting my husband like, you must want me dead because you haven't rescued me yet. Like, yeah. what is going on? But the thing, like, okay, so he didn't call, or he did call the police. He involved the police, but I didn't really figure out where he ruined anything else. It was kind of like, he's doing what you're saying, and she's like, again, Reed, Chick-fil-A. Why are you bringing pets to Chick-fil-A? <laughs> it's like getting mad that somebody forgets your Chick-fil-A sauce. Okay, that's whenever you can text angry things. If yeah. you forget my Chick-fil-A <laughs> sauce, I'm going to text you, I know you want me dead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So Reed is confused and shocked because why would he want her dead? And he doesn't believe it was even her that wrote him back because, again, this was a text message. Um, and he has his $50,000, and now he just wants to get his wife back. So we are going to talk more about this after we hear a word from this week's sponsor. Getting married can be one of the most exciting moments of your life, so why does the planning feel like such a hassle? While our friends at Zola can't get your new mother-in-law out of your hair, they can take the stress out of wedding planning with their free wedding websites, wedding registry, affordable save-the-date cards and invitations, as well as easy-to-use planning tools. Zola is the easiest way to plan your wedding. You start with a free wedding website that is so simple, it just takes minutes to set up. Choose from over 100 different wedding website designs that are sure to be just as unique as you and your future spouse. You can even add photos, travel and accommodation information, and there's a frequently asked questions section that helps address those questions that make you squirm, such as, can I bring my kids or the dreaded, do I have a plus one? One thing I really love about Zola is not only can you develop this beautiful wedding website, but you can link your dream registry with Zola. Gone are the days of sending Nana to three different stores and hoping she finds one of the gifts you really want. Now you can send them a link to your Zola website and registry, and it's all conveniently in one place. The Zola store has the widest selection of gifts at all different price points. There's also free shipping and returns, price matching, and more. You can also create a funds for your honeymoon or future home or really anything you might need on your new journey as a married couple. This is something I would have loved when I got married. When we were driving off to get onto our cruise for our honeymoon, I was literally opening envelopes and hoping cash would fall out. Having fun set aside as gifts would have been so awesome, and it's just such a fun thing to gift someone. To start your free wedding website and also get $50 off your registry on Zola, go to Zola.com slash moms. That's Z-O-L-A dot com slash moms for $50 off your registry. We want to talk to you guys again about our delicious friends with HelloFresh. Melissa and I each got a family box a couple of weeks ago, and as usual, HelloFresh did not disappoint. With three plans to choose from, classic, veggie, and family, there is something for everyone at your house. And you can feel good about what you're feeding them because each box is made up of fresh, responsibly obtained ingredients from carefully selected farms and high-rated, trusted sources. I am not a cook even a teeny tiny little bit. But with HelloFresh, I can feel confident when cooking because HelloFresh provides simple recipes outlined on pictured step-by-step -step instruction cards. HelloFresh makes it so easy for even those of us that are a little more Julia Gulia and less Julia Child because all ingredients come pre-measured in handy labeled meal kits so you know which ingredients go with which recipe. This week, our families tried the jalapeno popper burger and sweet potato fries. This dinner was a delicious twist on the staple of burgers and fries. There was plenty of cheese and a zesty kick to go with it that both kids and parents will enjoy. So get out of that recipe rut and start cooking outside of your comfort zone by discovering new delicious recipes in each week's box and get delicious filling meals delivered right to your door every week for less than $10 per serving and free shipping. For a total of $60 off, that's $20 off your first three boxes, visit HelloFresh.com slash MomsAndMurder60 and enter code MomsAndMurder60. Again, for a total of $60 off, that's $20 off your first three boxes, visit HelloFresh.com slash MomsAndMurder60 and enter code MomsAndMurder60. And now back to the show. So investigators set up a command center at the Gray home while they waited for the next contact from Quinn. As soon as they got there, Quinn fired off an angry text message to her husband, Reed, and she was just really upset and said that 
she couldn't believe her husband had involved all these other people, a.k.a. police, after she told him not to and was getting on to him uh, about the fact that he had already kind of messed up this transaction twice already. And then she also asked, uh, whose Ford was sitting in the driveway. Well, of course, this is the police, you know, police officer's car that is sitting in the driveway. So when the police found out that she had sent this message, their first thought is the kidnappers are watching the house or somebody is watching the house and now maybe we are in danger. So we need to make a move and get out of here and not be here at the house because we're being watched, which is kind of ironic because they're trying to watch them. Now they feel like they're being watched. Coming from inside the house. Yeah. (laughs) My favorite line. So 24 hours have now passed since Quinn had been taken and two money drops have failed. The sheriff's office decided that it was a good time to call in the FBI to assist in the investigation. So at this point, there were now over 150 people working to find Quinn. Which is just incredible. I guess I never realized the extent of an FBI investigation, but when I heard that it was that many people yeah. that were, you know, working one case, you're like, wow, they are really serious about finding people. <laughs> they really are, Mandy. I'm glad this eased your fears. <laughs> I totally trust the FBI now. Oh, <laughs> so they began trying to uh, ping Quinn's phone location with cell towers, which is something that you hear about a lot in investigations and different cases. But they ran into a problem because they realized that in between these times that Quinn was making text messages and phone calls, the phone would appear to be shut off. And so there was no way that they could trace it. I guess if you have a phone and the battery is taken out or the power is off, then you actually cannot ping that phone, phone's location. So that was kind of a problem for them because there was such limited amount of time that they would have to actually do something like that. So they did end up getting a promising lead from some of the phone pings that they got, but they were concerned because the phone appeared to be moving further and further away from Jacksonville. And they thought that it was going kind of our direction, west of Orlando. And as it turned out, somebody had made a human error Yes, I know. Somebody actually made a human mistake and wrote the wrong phone number on the judge's order to track the phone in the first place. So they had actually been wasting their time and tracking some random person's phone for almost an entire day. So this whole thing is just like... Oh my goodness. It's That's the definition of you had one job. <laughs> like you just yeah, needed to yeah. double check those numbers. <laughs> I mean, it changed everything. A full day is wasted that they're like thinking they're on to somebody. And like, meanwhile, you know, Quinn's somewhere else. A full, Can you imagine telling the family a human yeah, error happened like, like this? Sorry, <gasps> we've been, yeah, like we've been tracking like grandma's phone and she's not doing anything shady. Like, you know. Good news, like, we've been very busy. Bad news, <laughs> totally the wrong person. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I cannot imagine. Um, so really, this this whole thing, just when you hear the term wild goose chase, like that is this entire oh, case. Yeah. Um, it's like totally just that. So at this point, 36 hours have passed and Quinn's mother, Gail, has driven down from Georgia to help any way she could. And Quinn's mom, Gail, um, was from Georgia. She worked at Walmart and was also a dog breeder on the side. Um, and she drove down as soon as she heard the news. And how long of the drive was it that she said? Like seven hours, I think. Yeah, yeah. Seven hours. And she was like, there's – and I always think of like people – you know she had to stop at a gas station or she had to stop at a rest area. And you always wonder like – What's, you know, I I try to always think when people are in bad moods or being crazy, like what if something happened? Now I have to add of what if you think your child was kidnapped? Yeah. Like, yeah. Maybe that's why you're being rude. Not just like maybe (laughs) I can really up my list of why people are being rude to me. So shortly after she arrives in Florida, the kidnappers actually send a text to her phone that says, have the money in a bag. There's no trace of old devices, no read whatsoever. If he's anywhere close, she's dead. Be ready to leave at 11. That's (laughs) a lot of information. And all of a sudden, Reed's involved. And now it's like, "Mm, Reed, you had your chance. You're out of here. No more. Done with you. Done. So police believe that the kidnappers thought Quinn's mom could be maybe more easily manipulated, and that's why they, you know, cut Reed out at this point, and he's already, in their mind, screwed up a few times of these money drops. 
And so they are done with him. So the kid never set up a drop with a money drop with Gail, and they tell her to go to Joe's Crab Shack and drop the money out of the car and drive off. Why are they just going to all these restaurants? It's really upsetting. <laughs> They're hungry. They're eating in between. Saying, I like, swear. <laughs> they're like, drop the money off. We'll get lunch. Everybody will be on their way. So <laughs> they say if anything goes wrong, Quinn dies. All these places are so busy. And it's true. Like, they're going to have surveillance. There's going to be a million witnesses to be like, oh, yeah, I saw somebody carrying a huge bag of obvious money with a crying woman saying, where's my daughter? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And that's why I called you police officers that are now eating at Joe's Crab Shack with us. So this seems like a very strange idea. But undercover agents go to the Crab Shack to stake it out and watch what happens. Gail drops the bag of money in the bushes, and the bag does have a tracking device in it, even though they said they were not going to do that. But of course, they're going to kidnappers. They're always going to trace the money. Yeah. (laughs) And it doesn't have $50,000 in it. It only has $10,000. And so police were hoping to, you know, obviously lay eyes on whoever, whoever picks up this bag and, you know, quickly move in, take them down, rescue Quinn, you know, all in a good day's work, all in 36 hours worth of work after that terrible (laughs) tracking the wrong person got (laughs) a little extra time went down there so the money sits there for a few minutes and then a group of college age students kind of walk by and kick the bag pick it up get in an suv and drive off then they start making weird turns and driving through this neighborhood pull into a gas station and police are like oh my goodness they're trying to throw us off what are you know what's going on we're on to them blah 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 Hey guys, as you know, I'm someone who loves knowing a little about everything. I love the news. I love entertainment. I love it all. But sometimes I don't have enough time to get all the information, all the little details and the minutia of everyday news because my goodness, it's constantly going. But thanks to the Newsworthy podcast, I can get all I need in little bite-sized pieces. So if the stress of the news is getting you down, but you still want to know what's going on in things like the election, check out the Newsworthy. And in these 10-minute episodes, they're just on the go listening. I can listen to it quickly on a walk, on my way bringing my kids to or from school or one of their activities. When I'm in line at the grocery store, there's never a wrong time to listen to the newsworthy. But if you feel bogged down by the news and kind of the negativity of it, but you still want to be informed on what's going on, the newsworthy is the place to do it. Erica at the newsworthy is an independent journalist and her team does really all the hard work and research for you. I love that the episodes are so well rounded and there will be fun stuff like tech or big stories. But the way Erica gives this, you know, efficient and neutral overview of the news and in just 10 minutes each weekday, it's it's, it's perfect. Just search The Newsworthy in your podcast app or go to thenewsworthy.com to start listening. Again, search for the podcast The Newsworthy, two words, The Newsworthy, to make staying informed easier and more enjoyable every weekday. Around this time, Quinn calls again and frantically asks where the money is and says her life is in danger at this point. Everyone's confused because Oh, we dropped off the money and your kidnappers just grabbed the money. We saw them grab it. And, you know, why are you asking where the money is? Just then a Jacksonville police cruiser cruiser arrives at the gas station and casually starts talking to these men who had just picked up this bag of cash. So the FBI and sheriff's officers were extremely confused because local PD was not even on this investigation, but they phoned the Jacksonville PD and told them to bring the suspects in and that they were under surveillance in a kidnapping investigation. So much going on. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And can you imagine anyone in this situation? Like the FBI is like tracking. They have been on this case now for days and they're like, here comes a local officer. And like, what is he doing? And why is he talking to these people? And they're like, they don't know anything about this case. Like, you know, because that's kind of their whole thing. It's the FBI. They do everything. They're they're their own entity. They don't involve local law enforcement in their investigations. And so it was kind of like this whole thing, like, what do they know about these guys? Like, why are they here? Yeah. Kind of thing. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. So as it turns out, the men they had picked up just were in the wrong place at the wrong time and made a dumb decision to pick up the bag of cash. What are the... uh, Actually, it's Florida. This is actually... 
makes a lot of sense when you think about our yeah. state. Like <laughs> any other state, like why would somebody just randomly pick up a bag? Well, in Florida, it could be a plethora of goodies. You could have meth. You could have <laughs> cash. You could have, <laughs> you could have Chick-fil-A sauce. Like it could be anything. <laughs> you just pick up the bag. So, but they see the bag and joke that there was definitely money in there. And when they picked up the bag and realized it was actually full of cash, they, of course, freaked out. They get scared because they think they're being followed because, spoiler alert, they were. And they call 911, (laughs) pull into the gas station and wait for police to arrive so they could turn the money over. They worried that they had accidentally gotten involved in a drug deal. (laughs) Because, again, Florida, it's (laughs) – any given day you could accidentally be involved i'm kidding florida's great come visit we love it yay (laughs) but it's so funny like uh pick up the bag of cash and then in hindsight be like "Mm, maybe this wasn't such a good idea you know (laughs) it sounds like the plot to like a quentin tarantino movie like (laughs) yeah (laughs) now like the clock starts on the movie and like they're just trying to get rid of this money however they can it's so crazy So another attempted money drop for Quinn's kidnappers was a failure, and everybody is extremely frustrated (laughs) at this point, Uh, even me, as I was watching the state line. (laughs) So so at this point, we are now up to 43 hours since Quinn has been abducted, and there's been several failed attempts to deliver this ransom, and Quinn's husband, mother, and children are beyond stressed out and scared, wondering what is going to happen to their daughter, wife, and their mom. Uh, So in a risky move, the FBI instructed Gail to take on an aggressive tone with the kidnapper whenever he would call. And this was so that uh, the FBI was attempting to regain control over the situation because I think we can all agree the situation is out (laughs) of control. So (laughs) it passed control like miles. It passed control when that search warrant had the wrong, you know, phone number. Like we lost you way back there. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, seriously. So at around 2 p.m. on Sunday, um, again, she was kidnapped on Friday afternoon. So now we are at Sunday afternoon. So Quinn sent a text message to her mom's phone that said, Mom, please no cops. I am so sorry about all of this, but they are pissed and I want to see my girls. So at this point, she is pleading with her mom, like, please get this right. I just want to be released from this situation. So at this point... This was a text message, and it had actually been almost a day since anyone had actually heard Quinn's voice. But then later that afternoon, Quinn sent another message instructing her mom to tell Reed, her husband, to check his email because there was a photo of her that had been sent to this email address, I guess by the kidnappers, had sent a photo of Quinn kind of to prove that she was alive and she was okay. But one thing the kidnappers didn't realize was that photos that are taken from an iPhone actually have GPS coordinates attached to them. So the FBI was able to figure out very quickly within just a few minutes exactly where that photo was taken. Was it Hooters? When they went, Because I feel like Hooters no. is the only thing left. <laughs> yeah, seriously. But when they went to the location, there was nobody there, even though it was just a few minutes later. So meanwhile... Quinn's story somehow made its way to the local news, which is not what police wanted. So at this point, it is just a crapshoot. Nobody knows what is going to (laughs) happen in this story. It's very, very stressful, I imagine, for everyone involved. And so they see now Quinn's face is all over the news and they're talking about this really wealthy woman that is now missing. And the kidnappers, of course, got very angry about this because the last thing you want is media attention on this. And so they sent Gail, Quinn's mom, a text message asking why Quinn was on the news. And the investigators quickly had to come up with a story that Gail could give to them to appease them. And so they ended up deciding that they were going to tell the kidnappers that Quinn's car had been found abandoned, which led the police to visiting her home for a welfare check. And then that is how the story got out in the news. Very smart. Very good job. Like, thinking on their feet there that's like a yeah yeah what do you say like well clearly everything's been a cluster what do you think happened (laughs) like yeah (laughs) take a guess anything could have happened (laughs) exactly so after three full days had passed the fbi was getting desperate 
They decided to offer the kidnappers a way out of all of this and told them that they could just simply drop Quinn off somewhere and nothing else would come of this. Nothing, you know, they wouldn't do anything to them, whatever. Of course, you know, that's always a lie. Sure, they're always like, yeah, they're still going to prosecute you. Yeah, they're <laughs> you know? literally going to be waiting outside for you. But OK, go ahead. Yeah, exactly. So but just a short time later. That is exactly what happened. Quinn made a hysterical 911 phone call saying that she had just been dropped out of a white van and was standing near a shopping center in front of a restaurant. So when the police arrived, Quinn was acting erratically. She was hysterically crying and she was waving and flailing her arms all around. And the police brought her to the FBI office for questioning. And things got a little weird at that point. So we are going to talk all about the craziness that ensued after this after one more quick break from this week's sponsor. We are back again this week to tell you about Poshmark. Instead of buying things new, you can shop from millions of closets across America. It's almost Christmas, but it's not too late to purchase through Poshmark. Why be punished for your very last minute shopping for that cousin you forgot even existed, but will now be at your family's Christmas get together? Just check out Poshmark. You can find all kinds of stuff, brand new, even some with tags, and look like the much better cousin when you show up with a perfect gift. Stay tuned to the end of the show to hear about this week's Posh Closet of the Week. And one of our favorite things about Poshmark is that you can make the seller an offer. It's almost Christmas and people are wanting to get their closets clean before the holiday. You can make an offer for an even better deal than listed and everyone wins. They get a clean closet and you get a great deal. And remember, shipping is so easy for both the buyer and the seller. Download the free Poshmark app and immediately have access to women, kids, and men's clothing and accessories. They have everything from Coach, Forever 21, and Nordstrom. Listeners of Moms and Murder get $5 off your first purchase. Just enter the invite code MURDER5 when you sign up. That's invite code MURDER5 for $5 off your first purchase at sign up. And now, back to the show. Quinn is in the interrogation room, and one of the first things she says to investigators is that she is convinced her husband Reed wants her dead, and she says he has a really dark side. So investigators have already interviewed Reed extensively and have been working with him this whole weekend and believe that he was really a genuinely concerned husband, but they focus their attention on him and the state of their marriage and explore the possibility that really he could have set this kidnapping up as a way to get rid of his wife. Investigators learn that things had not always been sunshine and rainbows in the gray marriage. Reed told them that the last couple of months had been some of their best, but that they had really struggled before that. The couple had struggled with bouts of infidelity on both sides, and Quinn had, earlier in the year, been in rehab for alcohol addiction. Their marriage was in danger of ending if she did not get help um, when she needed it, but since her stint in rehab, the couple had allegedly been doing really amazing. We talked about earlier that they were even considering having a third child. So at this point, Reed was asked to take a polygraph test with a very experienced polygrapher, and he passed and was cleared pretty quickly of being a suspect. And in a bizarre twist, all eyes turned to Quinn herself, who was acting strangely uncooperative in the FBI office and refusing to talk about parts of her story with investigators. It was really odd to them that she's not going to do everything possible to help the detectives find these people that are responsible for doing these terrible things to her. She's saying all these terrible things, but like, She's not really wanting to give up a whole lot of information. Yeah. Well, there was even parts when they would start asking her certain questions and she would just flat out be like, I'm not going to talk about that. And they were like, why not? Like, yeah. You know, like, why wouldn't you talk about this? Like, do you not want your kidnappers to be caught? Like, and then she at one point had said, like, I'm just telling you guys them, you know, she was so annoyed and she was like, I'm just telling you the main things. I'm not talking about, you know, <laughs> you were getting bullet like, points what? is all you're getting. <laughs> It was, yeah, yeah, very strange. Super, yeah. So Quinn was allowed to go home and rest and come back two days later to give her story to the police. And, and this sounds like a very Keith Morrison line that Mandy has here. And what <laughs> a story it was. Um, so she details how she was kidnapped from her bedroom and taken in this white van to this warehouse. And in this van, or in this warehouse, rather, she's strapped to a chair with her hands and feet bound by zip ties. And eventually she was allowed to lay down on the floor of the warehouse where one of her captors allegedly began to um, sexually assault her. She told police that she did not try to fight him off because she feared for her life and that they had sex for hours and that at some point she even enjoyed it. These are all her words. We're not 
saying this. Yes. I will say yes. one thing I really did not like about this whole investigation is I felt like they had a male officer in there at that point, and I really wish they would have had a female officer in there. It was totally agree. It was really weird to, I don't know. I well, and then because he wasn't, he was like saying like, "I need you to tell me all the details of yeah. this." But I would have been like, "Yeah, I'm gonna need a woman in here to talk to me." Yeah, like, it you was know? just I, I didn't feel like they were being super sensitive to that whole part of it. I don't know. It just. It, it really just struck me like maybe, maybe just like tag team, somebody else come in here. So, yeah. But detectives said, you know, they thought it was a very weird way for her to describe the encounter, but they also agreed that, you know, people handle things differently. And so, and they even said that to her, like they, even though I, like I said, I wish it would have been a female officer. I felt like he did try to be understanding and not like come down on her anything for anything she was saying. But again, wish it would have been a female So she tells investigators that the next day she was moved to a hotel called the Emerson Inn where the lives of her husband and children were threatened if she did not cooperate. So at this point in her story, um, it's one of my favorite parts of her story because she talks about this detail that ends up, she didn't think it was going to be a big detail, but it ended up being kind of a huge detail in the big scheme of things. But she told the officers that her kidnapper had gone to a local Publix What, what? Shout out to Publix. I know not everybody has those. But so he went there to buy food for her to eat. And what he bought was what she called chicken drumettes. Okay. Is this a thing in other parts of the country or a different part of the world? Like, what is a drumette? I think she means like a chicken, not a chicken wing, but like the chicken drum, drumstick, a drumstick. Wouldn't you call it a drumstick? Yeah, a drumstick. A drumstick. I was like, okay, but we get you're a, flushed with cash, but drumettes, nobody calls it that. <laughs> I know, but they were like spicy chicken drumettes, but she kept calling it drumettes. And I even wrote to Melissa while I was watching the Dateline and I was like, why does she keep calling them drumettes? What are drummets? I don't even understand like it, this term. Yeah, it, I was like, okay, calm down. Like you're eating greasy chicken like the rest of us. You know, you're yeah. licking your fingers. Somebody, somebody is going to write to us and be like, you don't know what drumettes oh, are. Oh, I know. That's why I'm and, trying to say maybe another yeah. country. We're going to get – we always get mail. We will always get mail for something we say. Yeah. Let's let it be about chicken drumettes. <laughs> Yeah, I'm totally fine with that. If you want to send me hate mail because I don't know what a chicken drumette is, please, by all means. I can't wait till you get your third email and you're like, I wish I wouldn't have said this. (laughs) (laughs) So the investigators visited the Publix um, that the kidnapper had visited and asked the manager if he could search the computer for any transactions that matched the one that Quinn had just told him about. So they did find one and they pulled the surveillance tape of the moment that this transaction was made at the cash register. And they saw a man that matched the description that Quinn had given them. So Quinn confirmed that this was the man who had taken her and very quickly the footage was circulated in the media and the public was asked to help identify this man. Then two days later, a 911 call came in and it was a man stating that he needed to speak to someone because he had just seen himself on the news in relation to some kind of a kidnapping. Can you imagine Which- that? <laughs> <laughs> this case is too much. Just like you're watching the news and you're like, oh, wow, I'm on the news. Oh, they think I kidnapped somebody. <laughs> like. Yeah, like I better call yeah. someone. <laughs> and that nine one one call better call yeah, Saul. Better call Saul. That nine one one call is everything because the nine one one operator flips out over it too. <laughs> she was no, she was like, "Is that you?" Yeah, he's like, "I think I saw myself on the news, uh, possibly kidnapping a woman." She's like, "Is that you?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. So the man was named Jasmine Osmanovic, and he was interviewed by police, of course, and it turned out that he was a Bosnian immigrant who had come from a very upstanding family, and as it turned out, he was just a few classes away from getting a degree in criminal justice, so he did not fit the bill for this crime at all, and he told them that he had absolutely no idea why anybody would be looking for him and that he had no idea who Quinn Gray was. He told the police that he had been at a bar with a woman named Stacy the night that Quinn was kidnapped, but told them that he didn't know Stacy's last name or her phone number. So the police acted like this was like some kind of a big deal. But to me, I was like, well, I could meet somebody at a bar and like not be able to tell you their last name right. 
or you know what I mean? I mean, maybe you'd get their phone number, but they acted like it was so strange. Oh yeah, they were. It was just know, the craziest like, thing. I'm like, eh, I don't meet. Pe- I don't want to talk to people. I would give them a fake number, so it really would not help this situation. Yeah. So this guy, Jasmine, really was quite a character, and he he kind of like annoyed the detectives because he was just so like. I don't even know the word to describe it. It's not that he was like really cocky, but he was kind of just like, why am I here? You know, and just very like, I don't know. He frustrated the detectives during the interview because he was kind of full of himself and he was just like, well, I didn't do it. So, you know, yeah. Basically, just kind of threw his hand, crossed his arms and was just like, I don't know what you want me to say. Like, I don't have anything to do with this. And then started talking about how, like, well, this is a rich woman. So obviously you guys are trying to pin this on me. And like, but he was shockingly calm for someone who thought that a kidnapping was about to be pinned on Right. For somebody who just saw their picture on the news about a kidnapped woman, he was like sitting back like no big deal, getting ready to watch a game on TV. It was crazy. But he was super... I think cocky is actually the right word for that. I think he was pretty cocky and a little arrogant and like he knew more than them and just like outsmarting them. I don't know. I just kind of got that like he, to not be intimidated and to be in the murder detective room like that. I yeah, would pee yeah. myself as soon as I walked in there. Even if I just walked in the wrong room and ended up in that room, pee myself immediately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Seriously. So he started telling this detective that was interviewing him that he could prove his innocence. But at the same time, he was kind of standoffish about the whole thing. But eventually he said that he had a secret recording that would clear his name and prove that he was not guilty of this kidnapping. But when the detective said, OK, well, hand it over. He was like, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> uh- <laughs> You can be cleared of kidnapping, but like, no, I'm going to I'm going to hold on to this. Don't worry, guys. Yeah. So the police, of course, are led to wonder what exactly do you have a secret recording of? Like, are you going to give us a tape that's going to incriminate you in a different crime? Like, I don't understand why you wouldn't you know, why wouldn't you give us this tape if you if it was if everything was okay? the next day. So he didn't give them the tape. But the next day, the secret tape was actually turned over to detectives. It was some crazy thing where uh, this guy, Jasmine's girlfriend, found this tape and then gave it to his sister who then turned it over to police. I don't really understand how all of this happened, but the tape got into police hands somehow. And quickly. Yeah. Time. I'm like, yeah. where did you hide this <laughs> so special tape that your your girlfriend found it immediately? It was crazy. Yeah. So Melissa, what was on the tape? Oh, do I have to do this? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to be read the entire time saying this. And Mandy did this to me on purpose. So the tape begins with Jasmine narrating as he walks up to this Emerson hotel where Quinn Gray was in this room alone. And he's saying, you know, oh, you spent the night by yourself. People won't believe you were in here by yourself. Um You know, and the whole thing we were being told is she was kidnapped. So you would think your kidnapper would be in the hotel with you. You wouldn't be by yourself. So he enters the room. Quinn greets him in a really friendly way. And it becomes clear to police that she was not, in fact, being held against her will. She went on to have a ton of conversations. All of them made me feel queasy with Jasmine about how dumb the police were for not being able to figure this out. And she would even say, like, I feel so bad about doing this to my family. Like, am I a bad person for doing this to my family? Oh, uh, yeah, you are. Like, if you have to ask that question, <laughs> you already know the answer. Thank God this wasn't a videotape. It was just audio. So in part of the tape, Jasmine and Quinn can be having what detectives determine to be consensual sex, followed by laughing and joking about how Quinn's husband never gets this much action. And continue to the next line. Employees of... <laughs> <laughs> Employees of the hotel confirmed that they had seen Quinn and Jasmine at the hotel together and Quinn never to appear to be in distress. Now, that's not crazy to me because you hear about when people have been kidnapped before, like they're just going along with things and they're, you know, told not to make any moves. So that to me wasn't really like that crazy. Right. Did you think that was yeah. like, to me, that's not a smoking gun. Um, no, no, no. I didn't think that was like that. I mean, weird. they had plenty of other smoking guns. The tape was really proof that, you know, this kidnapping is a hoax and that Quinn and Jasmine have done this in an attempt to extort $50,000 from her husband. But why, when somebody's worth that kind of money, are you trying to steal $50,000 from your husband and getting the police involved and your mother and your children and all these, you know, all of this stuff? It doesn't make any sense. 
So according to Jasmine, this is all Quinn's idea. The two had been having this ongoing affair for about a month. They met at a gas station, which... That is where love is born. It is. Okay, so Chelsea and her new husband on Team Mom 2, they actually met at a gas station, Mandy. He saw her, thought she was super cute, found her on social media because, duh, she's all over social media. And then now they're married and they have two babies. So gas station love is a real thing. <laughs> but, I <don't... laughs> but I don't think it was in this case. So apparently they meet and start having an ongoing affair. He liked the way she pumped gas. I don't know. So <laughs> <laughs> Quinn apparently wants to extort this $50,000 so she can run away with Jasmine and start a new life. And she had that kind of money in her bank account, so it doesn't really make sense that she would do this whole big thing and get the FBI and scare everyone and ruin her entire family over this. But of course, Quinn denies it all, and she claimed – literally immediately that she could not believe how quickly she had been brainwashed. Do you remember that? Like she just walks in the room. She's like, yeah, I was brainwashed in one day. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> wait, what? <laughs> yeah. It was like Stockholm syndrome. I'm like, you didn't even have time to say the word Stockholm before you were already coming up with this. So yeah. yeah. And so she says her brain snaps and she doesn't know what she's doing. And she did not know Jasmine prior to this kidnapping. And they did not have an ongoing affair going. And she says the evidence of this secretly recorded tape was nothing more than a woman in distress being manipulated by her captor. Meanwhile, on the tape, okay. yeah, on the tape, she's like, oh, do you see all these burns on my arms and my legs? I like move these twisty ties around to make it look like I've been held captive. Ha ha ha. My family and the police are idiots. Like that's like literally the entire tape. Yeah. And then all the sex stuff that's just too much for me but go ahead mandy yeah so, <laughs> so reed initially stood by his wife in the public eye and even was on tv on the today show he talked to matt lauer and was saying that he wanted his wife to come out of this feeling wonderful uh-huh uh-huh let's just take a moment of silence there i don't even get that what how how could you I don't understand how you even I don't even know if it was true or if this story was not true. How does anyone come out of this feeling wonderful? I don't understand. So um, but that's what he wanted for his wife. And he said publicly that he thought they could definitely get through this and that he was standing by his. OK, boy. now I see why she's uh, so, so annoyed with him. <laughs> <laughs> So he even paid for her defense in this case, and um, she ended up pleading no contest on the charge of extortion, which meant that she would not serve any jail time for the crime. But she was ordered to pay half of the cost for the prosecution and $43,000 of the $86,000 that was spent on the investigation. So she was given seven years of probation. She couldn't drink any alcohol, do anything during this time period. And Reed eventually filed for divorce after he eventually came to listen to this very salacious sex tape and came to believe that his wife had intentionally done this. So something else that was on this tape that we didn't mention before was there was actually talk between Quinn and Jasmine. It was like joking, but at one point Quinn had said something like, or you could just put a bullet in his head, referring to her husband, right. Reed. And so that was kind of what Reed said was the straw that broke the camel's back for him. I guess listening to your wife have sex with another man wasn't enough. But when they started talking about like this joke that they could just kill him off instead – then he was like, okay, well, maybe I don't want to be married to you anymore. So they actually did get divorced. And Quinn later did get remarried in 2013. And she is now a yoga instructor. And according to her Facebook page, she is living her no. best life. Does it say uh, that? <laughs> oh, you're saying no, the like, I, living. okay. I'm saying that from what I looked at on her Facebook page. But she also receives $10,000 a month from Reed in alimony and child support, which for some reason just makes my blood boil to think about her getting that amount of money from him every month after what she did and put all of them through. I mean, I guess obviously it's the state of Florida. It's just based on what he makes. You know, it's a sliding scale. You get a percentage of what your husband's income is for those kind of things. But $10,000 a month. 
is a lot of money when you did all of this stuff. So Jasmine Osmanovic pled guilty to an extortion charge and was also ordered to pay off the other half of the $86,000 fees that were incurred to the police to cover the cost of the investigation. And he was also sentenced to six years of probation for his role in this whole scheme. So both of them, of course, are free now, living their own life. And this was just a blip in the radar yeah, for them. Yeah, this is a lot. I would be really interested in knowing, like, had they actually met before? Because that, it seems like this, how do you just come up with this one day? You know what I mean? Like, how on one day did he decide, like, eh, I'm going to kidnap this lady, but she won't really mind. And we're only going to get $50,000. Well, if he, <laughs> he was obviously thinking they were going to have some kind of fantasy life together. I don't know. Yeah. it's That's a thing. Like, we'll never know the whole story. Oh, and then police were never, never able to corroborate that they ever did meet before. That was like an interesting yeah, thing. Yeah. That was the weirdest thing. Yeah. They said that there was no proof, no right. phone records, no anything to prove that they actually did have a relationship, which of course, Quinn says they never did, but it does seem weird. And then I did listen to some of these secret recorded tapes um with her and like it does not sound like she's being brainwashed or forced into anything it definitely sounds like she is very comfortable in this situation so one of the things that the prosecution made note of when she was in this when her trial was going on was that she was left alone many times during this whole thing she could have left and so this is what they were saying like how they're proving that she was guilty of of being involved in this whole scheme and that this was an extortion plot is because he had left her in the hotel room alone overnight. And then she had also been alone numerous times inside of a car and she could have left if she was, if she wanted to, nobody was forcing her to stay in this situation. So yeah. that's how they're, you know, that's how they're saying like, she could have left. Like, you know I what I mean? I agree. But at the same time, how many times do you hear stories where like, people are actually kidnapped and they are told, hey, if you do this, I'm going to hurt your family. I'm going to do this. And you just think, all right, I'm just going to ride this out. And they don't leave. They have all these opportunities. You look at, I mean, Elizabeth Smart was obviously younger and it was a longer period of time, but there are times whenever people, and I remember people saying that about Elizabeth Smart and all kinds of people where it's like, why didn't you leave when you had the opportunity? If they're truly that fearful, then I don't know. Like I'm, I'm not saying that that she was not involved in this, but it was kind of, I don't know, like that wasn't a big thing to me because I feel like some people do leave. But when she was so enthusiastic about like, no, I didn't leave. I was here waiting for you, blah, 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 blah. Then you're like, okay, well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's different. You know what I mean? But yeah, so, yeah. but it was interesting to me too that Jasmine had that recording. Like he knew he couldn't trust her either. Like why else would he have this recording if they're not in some kind of cahoots with this thing? And he knows like if this goes south, it's going to look like I kidnapped this woman. And that's exactly what, you know, was played out. And if he didn't have this recording, who knows what would have really happened. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that is the wacky, wild, and crazy story of Quinn Gray's faked abduction. So before we go, we're going to do last thing before we go, but also um, patreon.com slash moms and murder podcast. We're going to be gone for two weeks, guys. If you need a little Melissa and Mandy in your life, I don't like how I said that. You can find <laughs> yeah. us there. And we're recording with Kim from People Are Wild this Sunday. So I don't know when I'll re release that, probably later in the week. And guys, I'm so excited because we're talking about the death of Brittany Murphy yes. on Patreon this month. And there is some conspiracy element to that. So, you know, I'm very Turns excited. Turns out Kim is very pro-conspiracy. She told me some things today. Yay. I'm so excited. I will excited. not even say out loud <laughs> because I said, you've got to be kidding me. So anyway, so you guys will have a lot of fun with that. But really, Kim is a um, a traveling ER nurse. And so she knows all of the, if you're not familiar with Brittany Murphy's death, just briefly, there was talk, was she poisoned? Was it um, pneumonia? Like what exactly happened? So we're going to kind of talk about all of that with her. And so I think that'll be really fun and um a good episode to have on Patreon while we're while we're gone. So you can check that out if you want. That was a lot of words. Mandy, you ready to do last thing before we go? I okay. am. So our first one comes from Paula. Please add more Mayo D from our Facebook group. And her question <laughs> is, what gift did you not receive as a child that you are still bitter about? Apparently, you've been waiting your entire life to say this, Mandy. Go ahead. 
I just really wanted an easy bake oven. And I never oh, really got those one. things were crap. They were terrible and nothing tasted right. I don't even care. I don't care. I don't care, Melissa. I don't care if it worked or not. I wanted one and I asked for it for like three years in a row and I never got an easy bake oven. And I was really upset about that. And then the second thing. Oh, you got a list. (laughs) It was just two things. That was it. So easy bake oven was definitely the number one thing I did not get that I really, really wanted. But the second thing was a Barbie Jeep Power Wheels. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And then I had my friend who I'm still friends with today, my friend Whitney, um, she got one. And there is nothing worse than wanting something, not getting it, and then your friend getting it. That is the worst. So I'm still upset about that. So I have just (laughs) – so I have just made up for it by – getting my kids all the things that I didn't want or that I didn't get. And guess what? They don't want them. They're not, it's not cool. It's not cool now. So that's my story. Melissa. That was a lot to unpack. And I think you might need to pay somebody to talk about that. Um, I, um, I don't really, I I like thought about this all day. I don't really remember anything that I wanted that we didn't get, but I have kind of a funny story. That's my favorite Christmas story. That's similar ish. So when we were little, my brother is nine years younger than me and he was adopted, but we didn't adopt until he was like four or five. So he was like my foster brother and we didn't know if we would get him. So anyway, my point being every holiday was really big for him because it was kind of like, we don't know if this is our last time with him. And, you know, I'm sure with my mom, there's like guilt and you feel bad. And so anyway, it was a big deal. So I remember one Christmas and there's a recording somewhere of me videotaping my dinky little gifts, which was like one of those Velcro ball things that you toss back and forth. And I'm like, here's me and Megan's gifts and here's Michael's. And I just like go around the entire living room and there's just gift, 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 gift. And just like, but I'm like trying not to cry in the recording and like, oh, and Michael got this and Michael got this. Oh, here's my Velcro ball. Mm, This was so fun. (laughs) <laughs> and then my parents did that jerk thing where they bring us outside to play with it. And then there's a trampoline outside. So we go outside and then like I just start crying my eyes out because I'm just such a jerk and like getting so upset. My brother has all these toys. <laughs> but I just think it's so wrong of my parents and totally something I would do to allow me to record this just I am just dying on the inside and I go outside. And I'm like, I'm so sorry, mom. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so I. Uh, that's probably that's my Christmas story. That's like the one that always comes to my head. <laughs> a very dramatic Melissa. I just you just see sweeping views of me just going back over. Oh, and he got a car, and he got this, and good for Michael. <laughs> so, I've, yes, that's the I've best. always been this level, Melissa. So the second question is from Claire C in our Facebook group and she wants to know Christmas music. What song makes you want to punch yourself and which song gives you all the holiday feels? I'm going to let you go first on this one. Okay. So combination for punching Christmas shoes is... I hate that song. Why would anyone want to even listen to that song? That's what I can't even figure out. That's a very specific story. Like... You just feel terrible about yourself by the end of it. You you don't even like shoes by the end of it. It's just depressing and terrible. And I hate- or Christmas. Oh, I hate everything. <laughs> I hate. Yeah, I'm just like I'm a terrible person, and I'm wearing shoes. And this poor kid just wants to buy his mom some shoes before she dies. I hate it so much. I mean, but also I guess it's sad. But I like the terrible Christmas songs. I love the stupid Paul McCartney song Christmas Time. Love that song. I think that one's so fun. What other songs do I like? I don't know. What other I told you the other day you asked me for some reason you asked me about song, Christmas songs I like. It was like you were feeling festive or something. I was. I was just listening to Christmas music and I was just like, "You know what? I'm going to ask my friend Melissa what her favorite Christmas song is." And I then you might be dying when you ask me. I couldn't figure out. <laughs> this is too emotional for me. But I love um oh gosh, what is the one I even told you? Um fall on your knees, hear, hear the angel voices. What is that? Night divine. What is that song? Oh, Oh, Holy Holy Night. Night. Thank you. That's like one of my favorites. But that's one of those songs where if somebody sings it right, you have chills. But if they sing it wrong, it's like like the national anthem. If if somebody sings it right, you have the chills. It's like rock, flag, and eagle. You are into it. But when somebody sings it wrong, like Roseanne bars it, it ruins the song for you. So those are going to be my two choices. Mandy, go ahead. Perfect. (laughs) So my most hated Christmas song is... 
Where are you Christmas? <laughs> no one cares, Faith Hill. No one cares where Christmas is. It's on the calendar. Why can't I find you? Yeah. <laughs> so I hate that song. I don't really even have a reason for hating it. I just hate it. And I think it's so stupid. And like the lyrics are dumb and like everything about it is dumb. So I don't even want to give it any more of my words because I just hate wow. it that much. Where are you Christmas? Worst song ever. I'm kind of with you with like the favorites though. I like more of the like, you know, I like me some Mariah yeah. Carey and like super festive festive. But when I think of Christmas music that I really love, it's always the more like slower and like quieter and probably Silent Night is really one of my favorite ones. And then also, what's the one I even told you the other night when I asked you, what did I tell you? I um, 99% of the time. I can't remember. <sighs> I really I don't, don't even oh, remember. Oh, Carol now. of the Bells. Carol of the Bells. Oh, but that's not like quiet. That's like a that's very that's kind of like a whole. <laughs> that's a, it's a very big production Christmas song. Um, yes, Carol of the Bells is one of my favorite ones too. But um, I do like the quieter ones. Like I like the whole because I really like like to sit by my Christmas tree where it's like dark and then I just listen to quiet Christmas music. I just like quiet things. I have kids. It's fine. Wow, that was a lot to unpack there. <laughs> No, I agree. Those are, yeah. I, but you know what? And I know I get a lot of crap about not loving Christmas. And I do love Christmas. You've been to my house. Like, I have appropriate Christmas stuff out. And I like, I'm so proud of you. Your Christmas decor this year is Thank amazing. You so much. I and love vice versa. it. Back to you and to you, as such it is so. So, um, anyway, <laughs> I don't know what I was trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> but no, and I like that. And I love like having kids living in Christmas. And I know Christmas is not always easy for everybody. I totally get that. It's sometimes really, really terrible for people. You know, we have small kids, so it's it helps cheer up Christmas, I think. Like it just makes it special and magical. And I know it's not like that for everybody, but it's um I'm trying to get more into the Christmas spirit. I have more since I've had kids. Before I was like total but humbug. But Mandy, are you playing the game? Are you playing Wham Christmas? If you hear Wham, what is that? If you hear um sorry, what is it? What is the song by George Michael? Um you know the song Last oh, Christmas that- by George Michael. I gave you my heart. Yep. We're not oh, we can't for sing. That. We can't no. sing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um but that song, if you hear the original version by George Michael, you're whammed. So you're out. So it's like the idea is to see who makes it the longest time. Date with Dateline has this going on their Twitter. And it's funny to read people like how they got kicked out. But it has to be the original version. And so I've made it the whole Christmas season without hearing Last Christmas by George Michael. I love that song too. But I like the I, like, I, I listen too, to the actually. Taylor Swift version <laughs> because I'm such a weirdo. But um yeah, so anyway, so that's my goal. So if you can make it through the Christmas season, you'll have to let me know without hearing it. But apparently you like the song, so it'll never happen. But anyway, that's a fun game. If you hate Christmas, you can still play. Wham. Um, okay, let's wrap this up. Apparently we yeah, have a lot to say. I'm sad to wrap it up, Melissa. This is our last episode of 2018. Yay! <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, I'm wow. totally kidding. You, you can't say I know. Yay. No, it'll be nice to have a break to recharge our batteries. And we have a lot of exciting stuff coming up in 2019. So it'll be good all the way around. It's always good to spend time with family. I mean, and we'll be back when? January, January 8th. January 8th? Mm-hmm. We'll be back January 8th. January yep. 8th. Yes. It'll be like you don't even miss And us. we hope. Yeah. And we hope all of you have a wonderful Christmas. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Happy Festivus. Airing of Grievances, December 23rd. Grab your poll. Enjoy that. If you don't celebrate Christmas, join me in celebrating Festivus. I am there. (laughs) Bye, guys. (laughs) Bye. We also just want to let you guys know to check out our Posh Closet of the Week. And this week it is at K.R. Touches. And that is spelled K-R-T-A-U-C-H-E-S. Make sure you check that out and see what she has to offer in her closet. And then one last thing, and we will get out of here for the day, the week, the year. Um, we are going to be playing a promo from our wonderful friend, Josh Hallmark. He is 
podcaster extraordinaire, really. Um, every podcast he's ever made has been absolutely amazing. Um, you might know him from the Karen and Ellen letters or our Americana or uh, my personal favorite, which is the playlist podcast that Melissa and I have both appeared on a couple of times. Um, so he has a new podcast and it is just as fantastic as all of the other ones that he has made. And it is called True Crime BS. And it is a serialized podcast all about um, the story of Israel Keys, very fascinating um, case. And we hope that you guys will check that out. We're going to play the promo. And yeah, we'll see you guys in the new year. In March of 2012, Israel Keys was pulled over outside of Lufkin, Texas. And in that moment, hundreds of lives would be forever changed, including mine. Join me on this strange, terrifying, and emotional journey as I attempt to find the missing, understand a killer, explore the impacts of crime, reconcile with those left behind, and subvert the genre of true crime. In the FBI files, they found images of over 40 missing persons on his computers. I think we, it's fair to say that Israel Keys had a fetish about missing people, which is why he wanted to ensure that his victims didn't get found. True Crime Bullshit premieres December 6th on Apple Podcasts and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. Go to www.truecrimebullshit dot com for more information. Thanks so much for listening to the Moms and Murder podcast. Make sure to check back with us next week for a new episode. You can also find us at momsandmurder.com where you can connect with us via social media. Please make sure you subscribe and give us five stars because giving us four stars would be a crime. Thanks so much. <laughs>